Hey, thanks so much for tuning in today. I'm actually on sabbatical right now. And here's the thing, I have to be really honest with you, I'm a sinner. Like I've said, I know that's not a surprise to anybody that's watching this or listening to this, but one of the ways that I've sinned is by not taking Sabbath rest seriously at all, let alone sabbatical. So I'm trying to be obedient to the Holy Spirit and actually take a rest. But we pre-recorded some episodes for you that we could show during this time. Here's what I pray that you will do, that you'll do a better job of taking a rest, of taking a Sabbath, and then even consider taking a sabbatical, and the Holy Spirit will refresh you during those times, just as I believe he's going to be refreshing me during this time. Enjoy this episode of Spirit and Only Leadership. Hey, welcome to another episode of Spirit Anointed Leadership. I'm so blessed that you were joining us today, and I'm very, very excited about what we're going to talk about today. I am blessed to have my good friend, Dr. Stephen Elliott, with us. Now, for those of you who don't know, Stephen has taught, uh, first of all, he's a church planner, and then he was a professor at Kingswood, but presently, he's a national superintendent of the Wesleyan Church in Canada. So, to the north. Um, It's so great, Stephen, to have you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I wish we could be in person. You're there in Canada. We're here in the States. And let me just say, um, we owe you a lot, not just you personally, but your country a lot. So thank you for putting up with us in the United States. That's what I'll say. (laughs) Chris, I am so honored. Thank you for inviting me to part of the podcast. You are like me, um, a died in the wool Wesleyan. You've been a Wesleyan for a long time. Um, And yet, one of the things that's been interesting is is that we've both been on a journey towards an openness and awareness of Holy Spirit in our lives. And and I just want to talk uh, to you a little bit about your journey. And for those of you who don't know, I want to add this as a caveat. So a couple months ago, um, the Wesleyan Church gathered for uh, an event that takes place every four years called The Gathering, which is basically a national pastors conference for the Wesleyan Church and uh, happened to be in Orlando, Florida. And Stephen was asked to give a to give a seminar there. And I would say this. Now, first of all, it was one of the very few seminars that uh, was, was asked to be repeated. So he did it twice in the two days that we were there. And it was by far one of the most well attended. Not only that, it was riveting. Like, um, it just was so riveting for me. And I knew while I was sitting there, not only has Stephen had a huge impact on my life prior to that point, but he continued to have a huge impact on my life during that seminar. So again, Stephen, it's great to have you. But I think to get started, I'd like to go back to your journey um, and how Holy Spirit got a hold of your heart and awakened your spirit. So would you take us back to your church planting days and what Holy Spirit did in your life uh, during that time? Let's just talk about your church plant for a few minutes. Sure, I'll try and be as fast as I can. So we planted the church. Take your time. Take your time. Okay. We planted the church in one of the suburbs of the capital city of Canada, which is Ottawa. The suburb is called Canada. We planted in 1983. We knew two people that lived in Canada when we went there, and they were already going to another church. So literally, it was Helen and I, and we had no church planning training. We we had no clue what we were doing. Uh, It's a wonder that anybody ever showed up to any of our services. Uh, if you can imagine, in uh, cold Ottawa, we would show up at people's door uh, doing door-to-door work with a guitar in February, freezing oh. cold, ring the doorbell and ask people, would it be okay if we sang you a song? And most people were so dumbfounded, they would say, I guess so. And so we would <laughs> sing a song and we'd ask them if they were going to any church and, and they usually said no. And so then we would invite them to our church. So our very first church service, we had about 20 people showed up. I didn't know them. They didn't First of me. all, wait, wait, wait. I have to tell you, I've never heard of door-to-door guitar playing evangelism to invite people to church. That's a first for me, Stephen. Way to go. It just tells you, like Rick Warren said, it takes all kinds of churches to reach all kinds of people. It, apparently, it takes all kinds of strategies to get a church started. Way to go. People were just so dumbfounded. Some of you be so stupid to be at their door with guitar in February and snow freezing. <laughs> 
like be minus 10 or minus 15 Fahrenheit. Oh, anyway. anyway, so about 20 people showed up the very first service. I didn't know them. They didn't know me. They didn't know each other. We were total strangers to one another. And and we grew. We grew slowly uh, over the next okay. 13 years. We were growing about 10 people per year. Uh, okay. So sometime around roughly 1996, we're running about 130 people. Um, okay. It was mainly transfer growth at that point. I mean, there were some people okay. that got saved, but very few. And I was so discouraged. Um, if, you know, people were clapping on the back and say, 130 people at church plant in Wesleyan. Wow, you're doing really well. But I didn't feel like we were doing really well. And, it, and certainly nothing we were doing resembled in any shape or form the book of Acts. So mm-hmm. in, in 1996, I shut down all of our evangelism efforts. Uh, and I was doing everything, everything I'd ever been trained on, lifestyle, friendship, evangelism. And we did concerts. We did Jesus video distribution. I mean, we did anything that you can imagine. We brought in evangelism. We did everything you can imagine to do. And we were just not penetrating the culture, especially evangelistically, to reach lost people for Christ. And so in 1996, I, I shut down our outreach efforts, and I, and I did a biblical study. And what I was doing, I looked at every story in the New Testament where it said that people put their faith in Jesus or they followed Jesus or they became a Christian, anything that would give an indication that a conversion had had taken place in a person's life. And what I was trying to discern, I was trying to discern what were the circumstances? Why was the church uh, being so effective in the book of Acts? And and why was Jesus being so effective? And there was, there was five things that came out of that, that probably I could have told you even before I began to study, you know, um, the church was praying. That was one of the, the things that I discovered. You know, Paul says, pray for me. And so, of course, um, pray that God opened doors of opportunity. And the second yeah. thing, that the Holy Spirit was working. You know, the Holy Spirit was giving like, gifts of, of evangelism to people. And, and Jesus said, nobody comes to me unless the Father draws him. Uh, the believers, number three, were usable and available. Uh, Here am I, send me, that type of thing. Okay. But the first surprise uh, in my study was how frequent miracle signs and wonders were in the conversion stories. And I had that totally caught me off guard. At mm. least 50% of the conversion stories in the New Testament, there's an identifiable miracle that's just either happened to the person or in plain sight of the person. The easiest example wow. is the story of the raising of Lazarus. And of course, we know Lazarus has been dead in the tomb for four days. Jesus shows up, roll away the stone, Lazarus come forth. And the very last sentence in that in that story says, and many put their faith in him. Well, yes. duh, if I had just seen a dead guy come back to life too, I would put my faith in Jesus. So yeah. the frequency of miracle signs and wonders caught me off guard. I had no idea how frequent they were in the conversion stories. The, mm. the fifth factor was that somebody made a very clear presentation of the gospel, which included talking about sin and redemption and the cross and, re- and wow. repentance, and somebody made a very clear presentation of the gospel. So okay. much of that, I probably could have told you that the signs and wonders component caught me off guard. But the other thing that caught me off guard was how infrequent lifestyle and friendship evangelism was. It accounts really? for less than 1% of the conversion stories. Now, in fairness, there are some stories where people got saved as a result of how somebody lived. The clearest example is the, the Peter passage where it says that if a saved wife has an unsaved husband, he can w- be won over without talk by the behavior of his wife. And so there are a few instances where how people live had some type of converting influence or persuasive influence on people, but they account for less than 1% of the conversion wow. stories. Wow. And I had been taught that lifestyle and friendship evangelism was the biblical method of bringing people to faith in Christ, but it did not stand up to biblical scrutiny. When I actually looked, I, I, I couldn't prove that biblically. I could prove actually almost the opposite, that it has a negligible impact on, on people's conversion story. And so wow. that's what really began my, my pursuit of the person work of the Holy Spirit when I started seeing how frequent miracle signs and wonders were in the New Testament conversion stories. Wow, that's powerful, very powerful. So you do that study, 13 years in to your church plant, you shut down the evangelism efforts of your church, you do that study, what happened next? Yeah. 
So that was 1996. Uh, 1997, we had the local board meeting from HELL. Uh, sorry, the uh, the local church conference meeting from HELL. Um, okay. It was extremely controversial because we were introducing um, the fact that we were going to be moving towards miracle signs and wonders and leaning more heavily into the person work of the Holy Spirit um, and less on things like lifestyle evangelism and other forms of evangelism. Very, very, very controversial in the church. Um, and so it was very confrontational. There was a lot of tears. It was it was very, very difficult. We lost a number of families. And of course, we're only running about 130 at this point. Um, but um, I was committed to seeing this thing through and we did. And uh, so, from 19... Just before, is this before you go on? I want to hear about the growth, but just before you go on, I want to talk about that local church conference from H-E-L-L, -L, as you said, because I remember you shared during your seminar at the gathering how painful that was. And you just said there were tears. Some of those tears were yours. Um, like, this was... Uh, so, and I'm guessing, Stephen, if you don't mind, would you mind taking just a minute or two when you say we were beginning to introduce people to the concept of Holy Spirit and the concept of signs and wonders. I'm guessing that means that you weren't going up and forcing people on the ground, you know, <laughs> into like being slain in the spirit or something like that. Like, I know you well enough to know that's not what you were doing. What, what had you begun to do? What kinds of things were you saying? What kinds of things were you doing that were causing such alarm in people? Yeah. Oh boy, that's such that's such a huge question, uh, Chris. And we've only got a few minutes to try and tackle it. Um, uh, one of the things that I did is that I made sure that our leadership team were all in the same boat, and so we distributed uh, coming up to this time period any books I could get my hands on on the Great Awakening, the Great Revivals of the past, like the Welsh Revivals, the Wesley Revivals, the uh, Azusa wow. Street, uh, the Great Awakening, uh, the Great Awakenings, because there's actually more than one, the Finney type revivals. Um, and yeah. so I wanted our people, especially in leadership, to know what does it look like when God by his Holy Spirit shows up in power and in presence, just so that people would know um, that whatever we were about to experience is not going to be church as normal. Um, wow. And anybody that looks in the great revivals of the past has got to come to that conclusion. It's not church services as we would typically know. And Chris, you, you very kindly said, you know, I am fully Wesleyan. I'm a fourth generation Wesleyan. My kids go to Wesleyan churches. My grandkids, go, like I'm six generations of Wesleyan. I've gone to Wesleyan schools all my life. And so this was a very, very significant departure for me from anything that I had ever seen or ever been taught. Um, nobody had ever talked to me ever about how frequent signs and wonders and miracles were in the life of John Wesley's ministry. Um, I had just assumed that he was such a great preacher and that uh, Charles' music was like the Hillsong music of the day. Everybody just go crazy about Charles Wesley's music. That that's what accounted for, you know, the great services and thousands of people that, that yeah. would come. And and uh, it's true. He John Wesley was a great preacher, and he was very systematic and very logical. Sure. And and Charles' music is amazing. But that is not the reason why John and Charles Wesley had such a massive impact uh, in England, and it has very little to do with why Methodism exploded uh, in North America when it, when it finally came here as well. So I, I wanted people, especially our leadership team, to know this is what revival looks like. This is what it looks like historically when God begins showing up in power. Uh, we want to have uh, more extensive times of worship um, rather than just singing three songs, you know, a chorus and announcements. Like we, we want to have much more extensive times of, of encountering God with intimate worship. Um, we started training people of how to pray for people uh, for healing, not to declare healing on them, but to request healing out of Philippians, present your request unto God, um, including times of silence, telling the people that uh, God doesn't want to speak to clergy. He wants to speak to all of us. And so we would Amen. include times of silence in the service and ask, speak to the Lord for your servants are listening, that kind of stuff. And, wow. and Chris, quite frankly, um, we made tons of mistakes. There's, if I could do it all over again, there's a lot of things that I would do different. You know, For instance, sure. one of the things we would do different is that in the early days, words of knowledge and prophecies, we would just allow people to stand up and share what they think that they had heard from God. And of course, you and I and everybody else knows not everybody that hears from God is actually hearing from God. And so <laughs> there was, you know, there was some really bizarre things that people were saying that they'd heard from God that just were not true. 
I remember you shared in Florida, I remember you shared that a woman came to you and said, I've, I've had a word of knowledge that, that three cities are going to be destroyed in the United States of America through nuclear bombs. <laughs> and I also, yeah, on a specific day. And I also remember you being a spirit anointed leader and you saying to this dear woman, well, two things are true. Number one, you've absolved yourself of the responsibility because you've told me. And number two, if it doesn't happen, we're going to be having a conversation. <laughs> just thought, I just thought, go, Steven. I should, I should have known this um, and brought better experience into my early days in this kind of stuff. Because I remember when I was a student, even way back in the days of Bethany Bible College, I remember one of her professors telling the story in class about five Bethany Bible College or Kingswood students that had come to him that fall and said to him, he said, God has told me who I'm supposed to marry. The problem was that all five guys identified the same girl. Um, and at Christmas time, the girl went home and she did get married over Christmas, but she did not get married to any of the guys. Um, and I, I, I remember as a student in Bible college thinking, people can be That's sincerely us. wrong. They yes. think they've heard from God. Uh, right. They're not being malicious. They're not trying to be evil right. people. They think sure. they've heard from God, but they actually haven't heard from God. And so, yeah, in the early days, we made lots of mistakes, and but we lost a bunch of people. But as you said, the proof was in the pudding. And uh, from 1997, right through until we finally left in 2005 for me to pursue my doctorate degree and end up here teaching at Kingswood, we were growing at someplace like 75 to 100 people per year. And so we were just nicely breaking through 1,000 uh, in attendance when, when I left in 2005. I think we had like 13 to 1,400 people. And almost all of the people that came to the church from 1997 on, the vast majority were not transfer growth. They were people that were outside of the faith, that were hearing what God was doing, and they came to check things out, and people were, were getting saved. And so, yeah, 1997 was a very pivotal year. Uh, again, I made lots of mistakes, but um, I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go back and change other than change some of my personal behaviors, but I wouldn't, wouldn't go back and and make choices different than I did uh, back then. So we're almost done with this first episode, which has gone, which has flown by, and I knew it would. And I can't wait uh, for our second episode coming up. But this is what I, this is what I want to say to our, to those of us who are tuning in today. One of the things that we didn't have time for is, is that Pastor Steve talks about the fact that on what happened is, is at that meeting at that congregational local church conference. Um, people really got mean and mad and ended up kind of storming out and uh, families left seven families left if i remember correctly and um uh, and pastor steve was like uh literally weeping he was crying that night deeply deeply impacted and hurt by that um and i just want to say that to say we don't go from a church that's going up tiny bit incrementally or whatever um, and then all of a sudden experience uh, 75 to 100 people coming to Christ a year uh, with the same leadership, by the way, the difference is dependence on Holy Spirit and allowing the Holy Spirit to do not weird things, not whack things, but just allowing the Holy Spirit freedom. We don't go from here to there without experiencing some friction or the enemy trying to get, get to us. And what I love about Pastor Stephen's story is just that um, he didn't give up. Pastor Stephen, you're just such an inspiration to me, and I think you will be through this podcast to so many other people, and you have been through the years, through the years, because I think people need to hear you'll hit those moments um, of resistance, and you'll be tempted to go back and say, okay, we're not going to do that. I was wrong or whatever. But because you push through, and you lost those seven families, and you were personally hurt by everything that was said about you, and that. But because you pushed through, Holy Spirit blessed, and oh my goodness, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So, Stephen, you're such an spirit. Would you do me a favor? I want you to take just sixty seconds, if you can, and then we'll then we'll close the podcast. I want you to speak to that pastor who perhaps is at the very beginning of that journey. Maybe they passed out some books of the Great Awakening or the Revival, so they've passed out a book on Holy Spirit, and uh, their leadership team is beginning to head in that direction. 
what and, and but they're tempted maybe maybe they're hitting that resistance what would you say to them what would you say to that S- pastor Stephen Elliott who was sitting in that front row crying because of the people that were about to leave the church what would you say to that person what would you say to that pastor yeah and you're right Chris I I was literally sobbing I actually had to leave the meeting I was crying so hard and uh, the accusations that you're no longer Wesleyan you don't believe in sanctification you you know, you're, you're just a closet charismatic and you're trying to, you're all about numbers. Like the, the accusations were incredibly, incredibly hurtful. What I would say to the pastors is this. Boldness is directly connected to the issue of conviction. Mm-hmm. If you are not convinced about something, you cannot be bold about something. Mm-hmm. And the reason I was able to stay the course and to push through is because I knew I had done my biblical study. I knew that what I was saying was true. And because I was convinced, I was able to be bold and to stay with the stuff. And if you're not convinced, you won't be able to persevere. And so you yourself as a pastor, you have to be convinced. Do your own study. Don't take my word on it. You yourself, take a look in scripture. What were the circumstances under which people came to faith in Christ in the New Testament? Figure it out for ourselves, and when you're convinced, then you've got to get your leadership team on board and persevere through any of the accusations and things that that may come afterwards. But uh, yeah, boldness is a is a is a byproduct of being convinced and your own convictions on something. Wow. Well, Pastor Stephen, this has been. Um gold. So thank you, Dr. Elliot, for joining us today. Hey, I hope that you have enjoyed this conversation. Please join us for conversation number two, because there's a lot more great stuff coming from Dr. Elliot that I want you to hear. So please join us for session two next week. Hey, do me a favor, follow, subscribe, share this wherever you take in this content. That would be a huge blessing to us. Also leave a comment or two. Let us know how we can serve you, because that's our heart is to serve you better. Now let's go forward and let's commit ourselves to be men and women of conviction and boldness as spirit-anointed leaders doing the work for the mission that Jesus has called us to. Have an awesome day.